There are 4,218 PS2 games, and I've got to beat every one of them. I've got to own the game because I'm playing on the original hardware, but I've beefed it up using a RetroTINK 5X, some component cables, and more to come soon. Can I do this before I die of old age? I hope so. The RPG selection on the PS2 is crazy, so look what we got here. Shin Megami Tensei had an offshoot called Persona 3, which is about a bunch of high schoolers having very real feelings about their own lives and anything terrible going on around them. High school is such a serious thing. These problems matter. Well, at least you can call me crazy for playing another one of the longest games on the PS2. Stay tuned at the end of the video, though, because this is not the end of Persona 3. The title screen has two options, the journey and the answer. The journey is what we'll be playing because the answer is something that we'll do later on. Once we start the game, we go to the config section and see that there are a couple options. Nothing too crazy, things that do make sense. You can also auto advance the story if characters are speaking and there's a voice actor accompanying them, which is kind of nice because then it goes at its own pace and you can really focus in on the story rather than when do I press X. Before the game actually begins, you get an option to select to see if you want to know what was added from the original Persona 3 to this new edition, the Fez version, which is really helpful because you do get to see, even if you haven't played the original one, some extra things they've added, which then at least you can appreciate maybe having them now. As always, I choose easy because it's the easiest way to play the game and beat it. This game comes with a caveat when you select easy though. You get to start with 10 of a special item that when your main character dies, as when he dies the game is completely over, you have to start back from a save. It will allow you to resurrect him during battle, which will then kind of make it easier to fight maybe a hard battle you didn't realize was going to be super hard, or even just use them and abuse them on hard bosses because you know you're going to die. The game opens with these words being typed onto the screen, and it says that it's going to give us one year to save what we want to safeguard. And it's not really apparent right away what that means, but just remember this because this is the overarching whole idea of the story. An animated cutscene shows the moon turning an ominous color as we see our main character walk by many different people in a downtown area. Everything on the outside seems to be fine, but eventually we see a young woman later named Yukari pointing a gun at her head, eventually being too chicken to pull the trigger. Suddenly we notice that the clock strikes midnight, and when it does, everything seems to go out, all screens, all electricity, and our main character walks down the street, seeing people who were normally bustling by just a minute ago turned into coffins straight in front of our eyes. But we could care less because we need to get to our dorm before high school starts, because it's super serious, guys. After we enter the door, a young boy with Tide Pod eyes asks us to sign something, and we're really not sure where this is going. I am so sorry for what I named my character, but I don't really feel that bad because I really wanted to name him something ridiculous. And so Saint Taint felt great because now they can say different parts of my name and we can laugh at it every time we see it. The boy disappears like magic into the shadows. Suddenly that woman with a gun shows up sweating and draws on me. What the fuck is happening? We see someone standing behind her and suddenly the electronics come back on, the lights turn from their uncanny green color to their normal colors, and this woman's now smiling even though she was just sweating and tried to shoot me. From here we jump into gameplay where the first woman introduces herself as Mitsuru and the second one with the gun introduces herself as Yukari. We actually get a chance to ask her why she has a gun and she says it's for a hobby and I really don't know what hobby she has it for if she's going to walk into the, <laughs> the opening of a dorm and try and draw on some student walking in. The seemingly unstable woman shows us to her room and says later. After a quick night's sleep, Yukari comes back to her room and asks if we need help finding our way to school. We say, nope, we can do it. We get to see a cool animated cutscene of us on a tram where we get to see the majestic school that we're going to. The rest of the game takes place here. Yukari gives us a half-assed tour because obviously she's got school too and she's really not interested in helping us because, well, she tried to fucking shoot us. I mingle with the other students trying to get chummy with them and then I find out that my homeroom is class F. This is where each day at school will end. As I bump elbows, I realize that anytime you talk to a character and they have a picture of themselves, they are an important character. So that means both of these characters are important later on. The school is pretty large, so it's a good idea to go around and figure out where each of the classrooms are, where each of the students are going to be, and anything else important, as you'll probably use most of it. 
We head to the teacher's lounge where our teacher will tell us, oh, I didn't read your profile beforehand and I didn't realize your parents were dead, but sorry bringing it up. Anyway, welcome to school. Just like in real life, we start the school year with an assembly where the principal says a bunch of uplifting, goal-oriented things to you so that you'll maybe focus on the school year to come. This fucking creep sitting behind me asks if Yukari has a boyfriend because he saw me standing with her and apparently she's the most attractive girl in school, I don't know. We meet one of our classmates who has a picture next to his dialogue, which means that we're gonna know who he is for the rest of the game. His name is Junpei Iori and he is a little weirdo. Okay, obviously he's a little bit of a weirdo, but every character has a character arc that you get to follow for one reason or another, and you get to learn more about them, so he's not just a weirdo for the rest of the game. He actually has things to say. After school is over, you and Junpei walk around the town, including the areas around school. These will all be places that you visit throughout the game, and they're all very important. This is just kind of giving you a preview. We get a scene back at the dorm with Mitsuru and another student we haven't met yet. And he says them. It has to be them. He's playing the pronoun game, people. We don't know who he's talking about, but apparently them are a problem. I won't show this anymore unless it's relevant, but here's how a day progresses. You get to see the day move forward after you go to sleep, you go to school, and sometimes you overhear conversations. Obviously, some of them are important. Some of them aren't. They're just flavor for the world. On top of that, during school, you'll actually sometimes get asked questions, and you have to answer them. Answering them raises a couple different stats in the game, this one including charm, courage, and academics. Each of them helps your character do specific things in the game. When you answer these questions correctly, you sometimes get more popular, you sometimes get smarter, and sometimes you get more charming. You want to raise these stats all the way up as fast as possible, but it's not necessary, though I will not always show my stats being raised in this way. After this, our character then walks around town and sees more important characters in more important places. When we head back to the dorm, we meet this man named Suji Ikusuki, and he is the director of this dorm. You can ask him some questions so that you get a good sense of what's going on, but he really doesn't have as many answers as you'd like, especially from the pronoun game earlier, them. Something is going on around here, we just don't know what it is. But he wants us to go to bed really badly, and he keeps talking about it. So, we go to bed. Once we go to bed, we see all of the characters, including the director, spying on us in a screen in the background, talking about the dark hour and what will happen to us. Why are they spying on us? Another animated scene starts up with a character who is standing out in the world where all these people were just here and they turn into coffins. Yet again, we see people turning into coffins. This character, however, has a little bit of a different reaction. He starts to melt and have these weird issues along with the coffins, but he doesn't turn into one, so we're not really sure what's going on with him. Back in the dorm where they're spying on me, they talk about the dark hour, my potential to be inside of the dark hour, and whether or not the creatures in the dark hour would have preyed upon me. Well, they haven't, so we are then returned to our own mind, and inside of our dreams, we go into the Velvet Room, this constantly ascending elevator, where an old man named Igor and a young woman named Elizabeth are talking to me about being a guest in this place. They also ask me to sign a contract to assume responsibility for the choices I make. But honestly, it's all really confusing, so I sign the contract under duress. Another long day at school transpires, as well as another scene preview of us walking through another important part of the downtown until we finally get back to evening where we're asleep and being spied on yet again. The director mentions common symptoms we should be having in the dark hour, just like that guy melting, but we aren't experiencing them. We see our classmate from earlier whose name we didn't know. His name is Akihiko, and he's gone out into the world and done something by himself. Not an ordinary one, he says. We don't know exactly what's going on, but the whole screen shakes. As fast as she can, Yukari comes up to her room and says, we don't have time to explain. We have to get out of here now. Yukari is panicking about whatever this is, and we keep moving up and up towards the roof. Once we get there, another animated cutscene plays. Creepy, shadowy hands crest the edge of the dorm as we stand on the roof watching, blood dripping down various objects on top of the roof. Until suddenly, Yukari tries to take out the gun she has, but instead she can't do it. She can't use the gun, so we take it but we shoot ourselves in the head. Somehow, shooting ourselves in the head works, and we summon this crazy-looking monster that just destroys all of these creatures that have come up to try and kill us. 
While it doesn't make sense now, the monster we summon turns into another monster, and then we enter our first actual battle. This game has a traditional RPG battle system with things like waiting, attacking, skills, defending, and we see on the skill selection that we use a persona to use our skills. This isn't just us using a skill. And at the end of the battle, we see a level up screen where we have our persona. I can't help but feel a little overwhelmed by all of the things being thrown at us at once. And it looks like Taint also feels the same way as we pass out from everything that just happened. While passed out, we have a dream back in the Velvet Room with Igor, who explains to us that Orpheus, our persona, is a manifestation of our psyche, which is so freaking cool. He then tells us that our persona is still weak, though, and we have a lot of work to do if we want to make it strong so that we can use it to save the day or whatever it is. Igor and Elizabeth actually thrive off us being confused, so this is how it's going to be. Suddenly, we wake up in the hospital with Yukari just hovering over the top of us. She says that we've been asleep for a whole freaking week. What the hell happened? Well, the stress of summoning our persona and fighting those shadows and whatever happened to our persona in the middle of that battle just took its toll on us. Then she says, I know about your past and your dead parents. So to be fair, there was an explosion here 10 years ago that killed my dad. So... Buddies, right? Having no sympathy for someone who's been out for a week in the hospital, everyone starts yelling at me the second I get back to the dorm about the dark hour. At midnight, everything stands still, time stands still, and these shadowy creatures come out. And only certain people can fight during this time, such as myself, who got to experience it firsthand when I summoned the persona by shooting myself in the head. They beg me to help them fight shadows in the dark hour, and we're like, yeah, I guess so. We finally get to see what Igor was talking about when he said that we need to raise the strength of our persona. Well, it's not just our persona, it's all personas, all 12 different arcanas. When we make social links in the real world, when we make a connection with real people, we upgrade the ability to use different persona. Your inner strength is growing. We must spend time getting to know people better so that our strength increases. We decide to go to bed early, but when it hits the dark hour, the mysterious boy comes back to us to talk to us and saying that our power is unusual because it's not held to the same standard as the other people who have one persona. We have many. Sunday is a day off of school for us, but surprisingly, at the end of the day, Junpei shows up at the dorm and everyone says, oh yeah, he has potential. Akihiko found him cowering out near the coffins of people who can't be awake during the dark hour, but he can, which means that he has potential like us. Not quite the same power, but still power nonetheless. Monday during lunchtime, Mitsuru finds us all in our classroom and comes to ask us if we can meet her in the lounge that night for something important. This will happen many times and this will be the only time I show this specific cutscene. When we arrive at the lounge after school, we learn a little bit more about this place called Tartarus, something they briefly brought up before, but now it's actually important. Tartarus is the school, but only during the dark hour. When it changes to the dark hour, the school twists into this enormous tower with tons of floors and shadows everywhere, these monsters. And he wants us to explore it so that we can not only progress through it to find out what's above, but get more powerful in the meantime. This is where the game separates both the RPG dungeon crawling experience and the social links during the day at school. You will be at school getting social links, learning things, finding items, buying items, resting, anything else you can think of. And then at night during the dark hour, you will come to Tartarus and level up, learning a little bit more about the shadows and what makes up the reason for the dark hour in the first place. Before this, we walk into a door that is in Tartarus that will lead us to the Velvet Room as if we're dreaming. And here... Igor doubles down on the multiple persona thing. What's funny here is that the door behind us leads to the Velvet Room, but none of the other characters can see it, so they are very confused as to what we're doing standing in the side of the room, doing nothing, saying nothing, making no noise. I'm just standing there doing nothing. When you enter Tartarus for the first time, you learn that there's a device here that actually lets you teleport to different floors in Tartarus, but we haven't visited it yet, so we don't have any. But this is also where you pick your party. Once you pick them, you enter Tartarus through this door here or through the teleporter on the side of the room. Once you're ready, you go in and prepare yourself to fight tons of enemies and go through tons of randomly generated floors. 
Upon entering, you learn that some people's personas allow them to use abilities that don't need them to be inside of Tartarus fighting with you. Mitsuru is your support. She will tell you about the different floors you're on and what's ahead of you, which is really helpful. She's almost like a map, just like the mini map in the bottom left corner. This part is the tutorial for Tartarus, something you've already been going through most of the game as a tutorial, but hey, once you're walking around, you see enemies on the battlefield. Pressing X swings your weapon, and if you hit them before they hit you, you start first in battle. If they hit you, of course, they start first. Once you begin battle, it's pretty simple. You attack, you use skills, you wait, you can change formation, you can change skills and tactics, anything you want to do. This is a very common thing in RPGs, so this part isn't necessarily hard. Once you kill all of your enemies at the very end, you get a splash screen with some experience, any items gained, and any level ups that happen. We also get to learn about the exploit system, where you get to find enemies' weaknesses. You can have Mitsuru scan an enemy to see what their strengths and weaknesses are against certain elements and different types of physical attacks. You use this to your advantage by hitting enemies weak against certain things, because when you do that, they stagger in battle. If you can stagger all enemies in battle, you can use something called an all-out attack, where everyone on your team piles in in this like Looney Tune style pile of smoke and people, your characters are flinging out, there's funny little words popping up like a cartoon, and you actually do quite a bit of damage to everyone. Your goal is to knock enemies off balance constantly, because when you do that you can end battles before they even attack you. This is really important for the rest of the game, and one of the reasons why you don't necessarily have to be the exact same level or higher to fight enemies. As long as you know their weaknesses, you can just fight them. A cool addition to the end of combat has you selecting cards that are randomly thrown about the screen. Each of the cards has something on the front of it, either a persona or another effect, like increasing experience, healing health, giving you items, or giving you money. You get to kind of choose what you want to do after they're shuffled around. You have to find which one is where, but you do get to choose, which means that you can just kind of give yourself some extra experience if you need it, maybe extra money, maybe there's nothing on the screen that's good, so you just go for a persona that you haven't gotten before. It's a neat addition to the game. After this, because our group is getting more tightly knit, we level up the arcana that is associated with our group, which is the fool, which is our personal arcana. The next day at the beginning of school, we meet this friendly student who calls us by name and remembers us from our homeroom. His name is Kenji, and he is going to be our very first social link outside of our primary group. We join an assembly where Mitsuru is elected class president, and she gives this big speech, which really just feels like fluff. I'm not really sure what she's saying. It feels pretty vapid. But apparently everyone in school is super impressed with her. We finally get the chance to do what we want to do on our own. We get to spend our time outside of school as we wish. And our first thing is, it tells us to maybe look for a social link or raise some of your stats, like academics, charm, or courage. So we walk around the school again with Junpei, and we get to see Akihiko surrounded by women who, I don't know if this is accurate at all, but it feels like I've never seen a group of girls surrounding a boy before talking out loud about how much they like him. But hey, you know what? This is their fantasy. Junpei and I explore the whole city, and we get to see this really cool map, and this is what we'll be using constantly. These are the only places we're allowed to visit, and they all have the different social links, different places to eat, stay, do things, get your charm academics, and courage up. You get to find items, you get to meet new people. It's a great area to learn, and it's not that big. You can walk around and figure out where everything is and have it down by the end of this little portion. And you do get to talk with people like Akihiko, who introduces you to this police officer, who understands the dark hour but can't go there. So he gives you weapons? He gives kids weapons? I don't know. So we go to the weapons selection, and he doesn't really have that much for us right now, but in the future he will have lots of new stuff as the story progresses. As for equipment in this game, you have four slots, a weapon, armor, shoes, and an accessory. Every character has them. Some characters have very specific equipment they can wear, some don't, and you just kind of find them as you go along from out of the police officer or in Tartarus. When you arrive back at the dorm at nighttime, you'll usually get a blurb from a character that's either important or not important. Sometimes they just are excited to see you, sometimes they have something important to tell you. In this case, Mitsuru explains that you are now available to do whatever you want to do at night. You can go to Tartarus, you can go out and look at the mall and meet people at the mall, you can go raise some of your other stats, or you can go to bed. It doesn't matter what you want to do, whatever you want to do. 
Thankfully, most of the tutorial is done, but you can still talk to the characters around the dorm and learn new things, either about them or about the game mechanics. So at least you don't have to absolutely participate. We head back into Tartarus and learn another ability that I don't really use very often. You can split your characters up to look for the stairwell up to the next floor. But I don't do that because then each character has to fight on their own while they're running around. Generally, I keep everyone together in a party so we can fight the shadows and actually defeat them like adequately. Otherwise, if they're fighting on their own, there's a pretty good chance that they die. I mean, the game kind of chooses for you, I guess. I'm not really sure. And plus, you yourself have to run around still, which means you might die if you don't have your whole party with you. So it's a cool feature, but I don't use it very often. The next morning, Kenji approaches us and talks to us about all the bad luck we've been having since being transferred here. Plus, all the people around school and town who say they hear voices, strange voices. Then after school, Kenji approaches us again and says, hey, can we talk some more? We now get to experience a social link outside of our main group, Kenji. Here is how you do it. After school, you'll find him with an exclamation point above his head. You talk to him and then you accept his request to go do something. This time, you're forced to do this, but this is how you learn. He wants you to go to a ramen shop with you after school to eat, and you guys just kind of talk about things. Right now, he's just talking to you about how you're transferred, and you learn a little bit about him. At the end, you also get a level up in the associated arcana for Kenji. Kenji's arcana is the magician. I arrive back home to get some kind of downer information. Characters in this game, including yourself, can get sick or tired, depending on how long you spend in Tartarus and if they die or get hurt badly while they're there. This kind of sucks because it's almost like a timer. It reminds me a little bit of a mobile timer. It's not terrible though, it is not super short, and it doesn't completely ruin the gameplay by any means. So don't let it detract from how the game actually works. It's Really not that bad. In fact, if you just sleep at night an extra night or earlier, then you will get better quickly. So most of the game, it was a non-issue. On my way to school the next morning, these two women are talking about something called the apathy syndrome, which is something the characters in town keep getting as the shadows grow in number and as the days pass. People are getting this weird syndrome that makes them just sit there and do nothing, and uh, there's a lot of issues with it. But they also tell me that the athletic teams are recruiting members, so I join the kendo team, which kind of determines one or two of the characters I'll meet through the rest of the game. Not only this, but whenever I hang out with the kendo team, I raise my level in the chariot arcana, which is really cool. It's time for another night in Tartarus. Now, as I progress through the floors, every so often we'll find a floor boss, which is protecting the floors above it, as well as a teleporter that will allow us to keep a checkpoint as we move further up. Every so often we'll hit a barrier, and the only way to stop it is to let days progress and finally reach story points that will allow that barrier to come down. I won't often talk about these floor bosses, as they really are just bigger, stronger, regular enemies, and I rarely have a problem with any of them. I'll bring them up if I have a problem, or if they're cool, but otherwise, you'll just see me grinding in Tartars. The next day, during lunchtime, Kenji seeks me out so that we can hang out. Well, every day during lunchtime, you have a chance for characters to let you know they want to hang out later, and you can choose to hang out with them. This is no commitment here. It's just, here's what we can do tonight. I decided it's time to try and hang out with my other friend, Kazushi, this time, who's with the kendo team, and he actually compliments us on how strong we are, and actually complains about his own side hurting during the fight, so we kind of stop. After practice, we see Yuko, the team's manager, at her lockers, and we ask her if she wants us to walk home with her, but she declines this time, although now we know later we might be able to romance her, which is actually true. It's still early in the game, so I haven't quite found exactly what I want to do when I want to do it, so I decide to grind a little bit more, just so I'm prepared. The next day, someone in school tells us that this bookstore just recently opened. We go in, and this couple talks about a persimmon tree that's at our school, but nothing more, so we need to go visit that persimmon tree. The next night, we reach the first barrier, finally, and we see that it's a bunch of desks and chairs piled up from the school, because Tartarus is the school, and we have to wait until we get to the right story part to finally get this barrier to come down. It's Sunday again, and the game lets us know that during Sundays, we can actually forego anything else and just study. And when we study, we might be able to meet someone new. And there's actually someone specific that you need your academics at max level to meet. Although this time, instead of studying, I decide to go see a movie. And the movies can actually raise your academics, charm, and courage as well, depending on what kind of movie is playing. Use your best judgment to decide what the movie will give you, just in case you don't want to. 
For some reason, they have the principal be jealous of how good Mitsuru's speech, that vapid speech was, so he decides to hold another assembly to say something better than she did. What the F? Speaking of Mitsuru, after school she meets us and says, hey, you should be on student council, which just so happens to be another social link. Last night in Tartarus, I actually got really tired, so my character isn't feeling well. If you go to the school nurse, he will give you something that raises your courage, but it's free. It does nothing else but give you courage, so go here when you're tired. We go to student council for the first time, and it's just a simple meet and greet where we still get a social link level for doing it, but we haven't met the real person that we're going to be talking to most of the time. The next day, I go to kendo practice where Kazushi just suddenly collapses and says it's due to his asthma. This is not how asthma works, but then he says, oh, actually, it's my knee. Last time I mentioned my knee hurt. Well, this is actually a serious problem for him. His knee is damaged, and he's still pushing himself to practice. After practice, Yuko, the team manager, finally accepts our offer to walk her home. We hang out, and she's actually another social link, the Strength Arcana. She is one of the few women that we can actually romance in this game. For the first time that night, I decide to fuse my persona together in the Velvet Room, which is something you can do once you start to get more persona. When you fuse them together, you can get higher level new persona that will allow you to deal more damage or do more specific things. In my case, I get a persona named Lilum because she gives me four out of the five elements to stagger enemies as I move throughout the floors, which this early on is extremely helpful. The next day, Wednesday, we actually have the day off from school, and Junpei gives us an MMORPG to play on our computer, where we meet a woman who talks to us, and she's actually a new social link. Anytime that we are not in school during the daytime, we can come play this MMO with her and up her social link, which is usually only Sundays and special days where school is not in session. On Thursday after school, we hang out with Kenji and we learn that he likes older women, and he has shown interest in a teacher and wants us to be there to help him ask her out, which is wonderful. That evening when we arrived at the dorm, Elizabeth from the Velvet Room calls us on her phone and says, hey, there's an alternate entrance in the mall you can come visit us in. Come visit us, I have something to tell you. Underneath the karaoke bar, we walk into this area where there's a dead end, but there is a door that we can only see. And once we go inside, it's the Velvet Room. Elizabeth has called us here to show us that she can give us requests for us to do things, and when we do them, we get special things from them, special items. So you take one, you do it, you bring it back to her, and she gives you an item. Speaking of, we go into Tartarus so that we can fulfill some of the requests that she has for us, the new ones. The next day after school, as a group, we go check out Akihiko in the hospital because we think he's there from the other night when we awakened our persona, but he was just getting a checkup. But we do meet this other mysterious character there with him, but we don't learn who he is quite yet. I decide to hang out with Yuko again, and we find out that she's having motivation issues. She doesn't know what to do with the rest of her life, and she feels like she's just along for the ride. She really wants something to do, and she needs our advice. Something I really hate is at night when you study extra for some academics, you can become fatigued because you studied too much or you studied wrong, and that means the next day you'll be tired, which means you can't go to Tartarus because you're friggin' tired. Yet again at night, this boy visits us during the dark hour while we're sleeping, and he says, in one week, during a full moon, a new ordeal will be waiting for you, which means now we gotta start watching out for the full moons. And how's this kid getting in? We get some much-needed time off of school for Greenery Day, the second day of Golden Week. And there's a couple of these days. During these days, we can do what we want during the daytime. And I choose to go see the old couple at the bookstore, Bunkichi and Mitsuko. They are actually the social link for Hierophant. And I got a persimmon tree leaf and brought it back to them, and so they think I'm a really nice boy. So they're like, we'll be friends with you. I do a little more grinding in the dark hour that night, except this time Yukari isn't with us because she's tired. And here you can see a golden item sitting in the room. That's a special rare item. You gotta get those. I raise my courage the next day by going to Wild Duck Burger and eating their mysterious burger that has mysterious ingredients. Every so often you'll see people talking or hear someone else say something that gives you an idea of where to find a new social link. This one is a young girl at the shrine and she's playing all by herself and they feel sorry for her. Maybe we should go check it out. Instead, I go on another little date with Yuko and we both compliment each other. I tell her she's cute and she says that maybe she'll tell Yukari how cute I think she is. Ooh, And then she says that I'm handsome and smooth talking. Come play Persona 3 where you can feel like you're actually handsome and smooth talking. <laughs> I'm just so special.
Sometimes characters will call you just before bed to schedule a day to hang out, which is usually the next Sunday. You are stuck doing whatever you select though, so you'll have to decline any other offer, which I don't think does anything bad. After school the next day, I hang out with Kenji, and he talks about how he's getting bored with life. He really needs the motivation to ask this teacher out, and it's starting to get a little weird, like, how do you not know this is not going to work out? The next day, I speak with Hidetoshi, who is the student council person that we'll be talking to for that social link, and he's a little odd. He really wants a lot of control, and he feels like he should be the one to have that control and do whatever he wants to exert his power. Next night, we find Mitsuru and Akihiko discussing Persona powers and how Mitsuru's power just isn't as strong as she wants it to be, at least in the support area. Her Persona is strong enough to fight, so they just want to know what else they can do with their Persona. And if you look at the top right of the screen, you can see it says full and then there's a big moon. This is the full moon the young mysterious boy talked about during the dark hour when he came to find us. We have found a shadow that is big and we need to go defeat it because, well, we don't want it to destroy half the city. We find that the shadow is on the train that transports us to and from the city. And when we get on the train to stop it, Junpei angrily goes off by himself to go fight the shadow and we have to follow him this is where we get split up for just a moment and once we get back to him we regroup to fight the rest of the shadows and find the big shadow this is an unexpected turn of events um you know the way she's sitting the way that she has a b and a j on her breasts i'm not really sure why but hey let's just go on with it she is not a hard boss though she does have a small time limit as it coincides with the fact the train is about to derail or smash into stuff so we've got to beat her before that time limit ends and it's really simple for some reason i'm the only one who's smart enough to run into the front of the train and actually pull some kind of brake or lever to at least stop the train everyone else freezes up the director shows up in the middle of all this and says thank you guys for actually having the initiative to do this because we really didn't need this in the headlines tomorrow a bunch of people die from a monorail accident after a good night's sleep, it's Sunday morning, and Elizabeth calls us on her phone to say, hey, that thing you did yesterday, there's a path that opened up in Tartarus. That means the blockade is gone. Before we can visit Tartarus, though, we had plans with Kazushi on Sunday, so we go to hang out with him, and we find out that he's trying to cut down on carbs, to go on a diet. Even though his knees bother him, he's still going to practice. The next day, we revisit the bookshop with the old couple, and we find out a really sad thing about them. Their son died in an accident, and they're confiding this information in us as they just don't know what to do with themselves. Occasionally arriving back home from school, you can go up and check to see if you can help fix the equipment upstairs you used to hunt shadows with, but that's not really what you do. You just watch a recording of a character who doesn't know they're being recorded do something, and sometimes it gives you some story. Otherwise, we go to Tartarus that night and try and get past the barrier to get to the next floor boss. One morning on our way to school, Yukari says, hey, the apathy syndrome cases have dropped since the last full moon and our defeat of that big shadow. Maybe they have something to do with each other. And yes, they do. Back at the bookshop with the old couple, Bunkichi loses his wallet and a mysterious foreigner hands the wallet back to him, having found it outside. I'm not really sure who this is. I never find out, but maybe we will one day. Inside of the wallet, Bunkichi finds a key for the car their son left behind, and so they're just kind of reminiscing about his son. Sadly, this isn't real high school, but you still do have exams, and you need to study, so I go to the library to study instead of doing social links so I can be smarter for the exams. A new development in the Velvet Room, we can now save our persona to the compendium, exactly how they last were, down to the level and the abilities they have, then you can rebuy them whenever you need them, so you can fuse them to your heart's content. Back at the bookstore, we find that the persimmon tree was actually planted by their deceased son and his class. He was a teacher at the school, but for some reason, they're going to cut down the persimmon tree, and they need our help to stop them from doing that. It's Sunday again, so we get on our MMORPG and play with our new friend Maya, who is the hermit arcana. And she talks to us in this very broken speech because it's an MMO, you gotta speak like that. It is now exam week, and pretty much the whole week is taken up by doing exams. You don't do anything. The game just goes through, and you answer a question every so often, and that's it. You don't get to do anything at night. You don't get to do social links, nothing. It's all about exams. Sometimes when you hang out with someone, you don't actually level up the social link. Instead, it just is a half level, where it says your relationship could become stronger soon. I won't show this anymore, but this is what happens sometimes. Akihiko finally recovered from his injury, and he is our fourth party member. Finally, we've got all four party members. Plus, he says there is someone else out there who's a Persona user. We need to find them and see if they'll help us. 
And progressing quite quickly through Tartarus, thanks to Lilim and all four of her elements, we reach the floor boss and just before the floor boss is a checkpoint. It's Sunday and we learn that Maya is actually a teacher at a school and she speaks this way to us. That's so fucking weird. But she doesn't want us to know where she's a teacher because then we'll know who she is. So she keeps that a secret. We now see the fruits of our labor from studying so much. We earn a high score on our exam and our classmates are staring at me. So I get a little bit of charm. That's right. I'm so charming for getting a high score on my tests. I head to student council and Hidetoshi has found a cigarette butt in the boys' bathroom and he is now interrogating everybody in the school and just blaming everyone. He's a very weird character and we've got to kind of talk him down from being so ridiculous. Kazushi is not handling his knee situation any better. He got some x-rays and he's worried the x-rays will say that he really cannot practice or play in kendo anymore, so he's kind of taking it out on us. Hidetoshi is now openly accusing people in the hallways of leaving the cigarette butt in the boys' bathroom. And he's doing this with literally no evidence. He just really wants to find whoever it is because he thinks if we don't have order, things are not going to go well. And this is not great. We have to actually step in and help him. And we even tell him to lighten up. He's really having a tough time figuring out how to use this small amount of power he has in student council. The next morning, Junpei can't help but be weird by talking about the young girl, Fuka, who is the other Persona user we would like to join our party. He's just kind of being overprotective of someone he doesn't even know yet. After school that day, Yukari overhears some girls making fun of someone for no good reason, but one of the friends suddenly hears a voice, and she's very confused. One of them doesn't hear it. Kazushi, on the other hand, is having more trouble with his knee and even more trouble hiding it from everyone else as we're the only person who knows he's having problems with it. He does not want anyone else to know, so he does not get kicked off the team. Are you stupid or something? <laughs> yes, he is, dude. The fuck, Jupe? More like stupid. He's defective. <laughs> Got him. After Junpei's fall from grace, we decide to hang out with Yuko after school, and we find out that she's kind of being bullied by some of the other girls in the school for something silly, really, and they're just moving her shoes. I think the issue had to do with boys, of course, a little bit earlier in her life, or in school at least, and then she, they come up here and say that being muscular is bad, and oh, her boyfriend's going to hear, obviously, referring to us, and... <laughs> It's very juvenile, but I guess they're bullying her. It's our scheduled time Sunday with Kenji, and this time he's acting out the plan of him asking out the teacher, Amiri. This dude is seriously insane. I picked the mean option, the option that he did not want to hear, and it actually gets our relationship stuck in a rut because I didn't agree with him. I mean, I'm not going to agree with a weirdo. I, maybe in the future I will, just so I can get his social link hired. That night, I start working on some more fusions for my persona, and I get to see the social links and what they do when you make persona. Right here, you can see the rank of the emperor, which is one of the social links that I have. Every time you level up that social link, you get this extra pool of experience for a persona to get when they're made. So that way, when you make a persona and you have a high social link, you get a much higher level persona than you could even make, which is what your character level is. You can only make a persona that's your character level. But with this extra boost, you can really get strong. So it's in your best interest to get social links as high up as they can be. And then make persona of the highest level social links you have. The next day, Kazushi and I hang out, but he learns that his hamstring is being torn apart, and if he keeps this up, he will not be able to walk anymore. So he is having a dilemma. Should he continue to practice or give up? Not too long ago, we heard some people talking about ghosts in the school, which at this point we're kind of thinking it's shadows, but they really keep talking about ghosts, and three girls were found unconscious in the school. So Junpei tells us a scary story, or at least his idea of the scary story that's been going on. But now the characters want to figure out what these ghosts are because they're pretty sure they're shadows. Just like clockwork, the mysterious boy comes to tell us you have a week until the full moon. Yeah, dude, I can see the fucking number in the top right corner of the screen. The next morning, Yukari is really stoked on this ghost story. She is ready to put in the work to figure this thing out. Oh my god, Kenji is back at it. He wants to ask Miss Canal, or her name is Amiri, out, and he's about to go do it after school. And I'm like, I mean, sure, whatever. I'll just I'll just cheer you on from the sidelines. He comes back and says, Can you believe it? Before I asked her out, she asked me if I wanted private lessons. So I said, Yes, this kid misunderstands fucking anything. After school the next day, Yuka and I start getting even closer.
What I think is most funny is that this is probably the most touching you'll see in this game, honestly, even though we're supposed to be in a relationship. After that sickening display of love, we see these kids running around and she talks to them and apparently they just need her help doing something. So we all go out together and actually practice playing and running around. They want to run faster, so she tries to help them run faster. The next day, Kenji's talking my ear off about how Amiri loves him even though it's fucking not true and I'm starting to realize that I'm really looking Kenji deeply in the eye and I think I want him to be my boyfriend. So we need to get him off this Amiri crap. As you progress through Tartarus, the cards at the end of battle rank up and level, and you get more of whatever it is. More experience, more money, who knows? Whatever the number is, it's much higher. At the end of the week, Yukari comes back with this enormous detective novel on the fucking ghost story. I haven't done shit about it, but she knows everything, and she says she thinks it's not ghosts, it's shadows, or at least something not ghost-like. So we go to this area in the town that is notoriously known for being a bad area, so I don't know why we're going here, but she pulls us over there, and as we start to question people about things real quickly, we get attacked by them. But Akihiko's friend from the hospital comes by and actually helps us. We learn his name is Shinjiro, and he's just a moody little piece of shit, ain't he? After this, Shinjiro tells us that it's not the shadows doing this, it's Fuka's spirit. Something happened to her, she's been being bullied at school, and these girls who bullied her are the ones who are collapsing and going unconscious, it's Fuka's spirit. Weird. The next day, I hang out with Yuko again, and she needs some reassurance that she is well equipped enough to help these kids, even though they're just young kids, and this isn't super important, but she's doing a good job, she wants to hear it. The next day, we get more developments, in fact, we understand what's going on now. The girl that we saw earlier making fun of Fuka, at least to her friend, says that she can now hear Fuka's voice, just like the other girl claimed she could hear a voice. She apparently has been talking to teachers about it, but no one is willing to talk about it to her or with anyone else, saving the school and all the teachers and stuff like that, so that no, no one gets in trouble for whatever happened to Fuka. Well, what happened was is the girls locked her in the gym overnight, and she didn't come back the next day. This is because she's a Persona user, so she probably went to the dark hour because the school changes into fucking Tartarus. So she was stuck there, but she didn't come back. So they think Fuka is probably stuck in the dark hour somewhere. At first they theorize maybe she's dead, but they don't want to just go with that answer because no one knows about the dark hour enough to know if she would be dead or if she could even live. They know that the flow of time is a little bit slower, actually a lot slower. At this point, she's been locked in there for 10 days. Honestly, it's only been 10 hours, an hour a day. The group decides that they must do something about this tonight because no one knows what will happen to her. But first, I go and hang out with Bunkichi and Mitsuru, and they talk about their son, and they reminisce a little bit more about him, and we learn just a little bit more about who he was and how much they really did love him and how much his death affected them. Okay, back to Fuka. Junpei unlocks a door as he leaves school so that they can sneak in later, before Tartarus is even there. They want to check the school out and they also want to get the key to the gym. That way they can unlock it and go in and maybe start the dark hour inside the school. Myself and Yukari sneak around until we finally find the goddamn gym key. But look at the question the game asked me. It says, what does it say on this one? I can't fucking see it, so I just guess it's the gym key. And she's like, yeah, it is. This girl from before who was bullying Fuka is the one who's recently hearing voices, begins hearing her voice now that she's awake during the dark hour. We told her to stay put, but she fucking gets up and walks on over to Tartarus. We wake up in the dark hour after spending the night in the gym, and well, it fucking didn't work. We're all in random spots in Tartarus. But the mysterious boy comes and gives us a fucking jump scare just to talk to us about shit. Because of the extreme distance, Mitsuru can't provide any support, so we're fucked. I go up one floor and, oh, thank God, Junpei and Akihiko are here. And we hear a voice, a human voice. And it's around the corner and there's Fuka. Hi, Fuka. She's totally okay. She's like just chilling here in the dark hour. This is where the kids finally recognize the full moon has an effect on whatever is going on with the shadows and all this crazy stuff that's happening. Also, I didn't know that Tartarus had windows. When we get back down to the first floor, well, there's a fucking boss down here, and it's got Mitsuru in its grasp, and then the fucking girl who made fun of Fuka walks into Tartarus. None of this is going well. But don't worry, we get treated to a lovely anime scene. Mitsuru gets tossed around like a fucking doll, and then Fuka awakens her persona to fight, and she actually saves the girl who is making fun of her, which is very nice of her. Apparently, Fuka's persona can, like, envelop her in this 
like crotch ball. I don't know what's going on there, but she saves herself and the other girl. And now we regroup and fight these dudes. While there are two of this boss, it's really not too bad. One of them has a weakness to ice, Mabufu, and the other one has a weakness to one of the physical types of attacks, which is great because all of our characters have enough to actually knock them down and then eventually do an all-out attack, which just fucking destroys them. So this boss is not at all difficult, especially on beginner mode. After the battle, Fuka makes sure Natsuki is her name, is okay, and yes, she is. Everyone regroups and gets the shit out of there, and everyone gets a well-rested night of sleep. Doesn't matter what we did the night before, we've still got to do some social links. So we go back to our boyfriend Kenji, and he'll get there, don't worry. But he talks about our future and his future, and how they should be together, right? A new store opens up that lets us fuse weapons and persona together to make powerful weapons and armor. Something I actually don't do in this very first playthrough here. But she does have some really cool things in her shop you can buy. Things that will upgrade your persona's stats. Things that will that you don't necessarily think you'd find. They're just like this cool off the side shop that gives you some cool options to play the game. And we do have a few things we can do but I really don't worry about this much because it just wasn't necessary for me. If I have nothing to do at night, I can head over to the mall and go to Game Panic. Some of the games in there will give your three main stats an upgrade. Sometimes they do stuff with your persona, but sometimes you get lucky and get a main stat like Courage. That night, Fuka is invited to stay in our dorm with us and work on the team. And it's great and all, but Yukari's a little weirded out about it. You know, Fuka was kind of forced into this whole thing, and then we saved her, and now Mitsuru, especially, kind of is wanting her to join, almost not giving her a choice, or at least it seems like that. But everyone talks about the fact that there is a pattern. The full moon corresponds with these big shadows. The next morning, we get a little bit of commentary from Yukari about what happened last night. Mitsuri Senpai saved Fuka because it was the right thing to do? Or was it just because she's a Persona user and we need her? <gasps> Ooh, is Mitsuru a good person? Yeah, let's say she is. I guess so. Oh, Yukari. Well, whether or not she joins is up to her. Sorry to bring this up out of the blue. I think it's a valid thing to think, right? Mitsuru, while she is... Um, obviously she's smart and she's, you know, motivated and ambitious and all this stuff. Um, like she d doesn't mean she has everyone's best interest in mind. She might have, her, you know, she might be more worried about one thing and it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong, but uh, that's a good question to ask. I like that. Yukari wrestles with these thoughts for several more days, which is really neat that she keeps thinking about this. She really is worried about someone else and the game really does a good job of telling us. Fuka comes back to school because she hasn't been there in 10 days. She was stuck in the fucking dark hour. And the students are making fun of her, calling her ghost girl, which is so fucking typical. Fuck you guys. But then Natsuki comes in and has completely changed. Realizes she was wrong. Actually does realize she was wrong and treats her well. I think she just realized, oh yeah, Fuka really is a person too. And she helped me. Why would I not do the same for her? Which is a cool change. Ghost Boy is back to bother us yet again while we're sleeping. I just love how my little head's poking out underneath the covers, and I don't get up. I just sit there and stare at him like I just can't be bothered to get up. But we do continue to raise our social link with this kid, Death. Fuka does end up joining the team, and this means Mitsuru can come to the front line. You can depend on me, she says. She now gets to fight with us. The next day, I help Yuko coach the kids, and this makes our bond much stronger. I mean, we're just hanging out. I'm interested in what she's doing. She's interested in what she's doing. It's a great time. It seems as though our relationship is becoming more intimate. I'm sure Junpei's just a little upset that I kicked him out of the party for Mitsuru, but I like Mitsuru a little better. Dungeon crawling has been getting just a little bit harder. We have enemies with skills like Mudo that will instantly kill you. We have enemies that have almost no weaknesses and some that have zero at all. Eventually, we do get to some more of the floor bosses. Some of them have tons and tons of health and almost no weaknesses. And even when they do and we do an all-out attack on them, we do almost no fucking damage. So it's just kind of a, a battle of attrition. Who's going to lose first? And we do have the ability to heal, so it's not too bad, but, you know, some of them are just more slogs than difficult. Revisiting the police officer who sells us stuff, we can finally see, once we get past some of the barriers, that he does sell stronger and stronger things. Although I don't necessarily use the weapons much, the armor is a big help. 
I finally make my way over to the shrine where that little girl is, and she's a social link. But I can't have her as a social link until I give her the correct items. So I've got to go get her some food. Then she'll be my social link. The music club finally opens up and lets us join, and Fuka actually recommends us. And we meet this boy named Kisuke. He's very nerdy, and we get to know him. And our, this social link is Fortune. We finally get to go on a social link trip together with this little girl who's like 9 and I'm 15, it's kind of weird. And she takes us to Wild Duck Burger, and eventually we get to meet this guy out by the playground when we're playing with her, a thin young man. He is actually another social link later on. This poor young girl constantly talks about how her mom and dad fight, and honestly it sounds like they might be going through a divorce, and she is not taking it well, so I guess she's going to talk to a 15 year old about her parents divorcing. On our way back home, we see Yukari and Fuka standing in front of a dog. This cute little dog is just sitting there, and a woman walks by and explains to us that this dog's owner, a priest, died suddenly. And so the dog is just kind of wandering around. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know what to do. And he's a very smart dog. He's also very cute. I mean, come on. How can you? So we do see him every so often, and we just kind of pet him. We learn a little bit about him, but we don't know what else we're going to do with this dog. We walk inside the dorm and the director talks to us about how there are a certain number of shadows that we need to destroy. He's just found this out or he knows this, I'm not sure. But he says, we defeated four and there's eight left. I mean, we have defeated four. So this is good news, right? If we defeat all of them, the dark hour goes away. And this is what we want, right? Only eight more? The next day is Sunday and we hang out with Maya online and she says it's sexist to think women can only be happy when they're tied down, when they're married. And this can't be more relevant than today than ever, you know, like obviously that's true. Yeah, you don't have to be married. Yukari is very much a detective. She wants to get down to the truth and she is feeling weird about what's going on with the shadows. She is for sure we don't know everything there is to know about them, which yeah, it's true. That evening when I get home, I go up and look at one of the videos that are left on the machine and we get to see this ridiculous scene where Mitsuru walks into Junpei's room and thinks someone has come in and ransacked his room. When Junpei arrives and the police officer's there waiting to see if someone did steal stuff from his room, he says this is how it usually is. So Mitsuru is very, very proper from a very rich family and she misunderstands the state of his room. She does apologize, but I can see the disparity between someone who lives like this and someone who absolutely didn't even know this was possible except for a break-in. <laughs> After this, we're treated to a cutscene where a pale young man and two of his friends behind him accost this young man in the alleyway where we tried to get answers earlier. This guy pulls out a gun and shoots him. Apparently he's not dead, but I guess it doesn't matter. These people don't seem good, and they seem like they're going to be a problem. Especially since they're going around killing people? I mean, they seem pretty bad. Coincidentally, these women are talking about a site online where you can get revenge on someone just by letting this website know. Which probably happens to be the three people who killed that dude and talked about revenge earlier. During music club that night, Kisuke, who is usually a very good musician, decides to suddenly turn into a doctor. Well, apparently his dad wants him to be a doctor. His dad is a doctor and has a hospital, but he's not really sure what he wants to do. I don't think he wants to be a doctor. This next scene with Shinjiro and Akihiko, I think we learn that Shinjiro is a Persona user, and he something happened, and he will not go back to using that power. At one point, Maya talks about a well-dressed man in the mall, where if you are charming enough, he will talk to you. He's a social link. He's the devil arcana. Well, you can't talk to him yet because I don't have my charm up to smooth. Luckily for me, the solution to this problem is right next to us in a coffee shop where you can get your charm raised by drinking coffee at night instead of doing anything else. Kenji lets us know that Amiri is leaving the school, most likely because of whatever she's got going on, but he thinks he's fucking going with her. It's so sad because she won't even return his calls. The next day I hang out with Kazushi and he needs help with his nephew getting him a gift because he can't get up and do much. So we ask, maybe you should get a video game for him. And he's like, yeah, sure, I guess maybe that's a good idea. The next day during student council, Hidetashi just does not understand. He should stop just accusing people of taking stuff. We're trying to talk him down, but this kid ain't listening to shit. This next scene shows Yukari and Fuka talking. Yukari is obviously still worried about the fact that Fuka was kind of forced onto the team, but she also thinks Mitsuru is hiding much more about what she knows of Tartarus in the shadows. And so she's kind of 
prodding Fuka for maybe some help, and she doesn't want to make trouble, but honestly, I mean, you're doing this crazy thing. You should probably have all the answers, right? The next day is a sad day for Kenji, as he sees Amiri with another man, probably because that's actually the person she's going to marry, and the person she's leaving the school with, to live somewhere else, probably to get away from kids like Kenji. So she's, you know, up there doing her thing, and we're over here spying on her. Kenji does take it kind of hard, but you know what? He has learned some lessons along the way, and I think it's probably pretty adult of him to not get too upset. That night during the dark hour, the boy who comes to tell us every week before the full moon says, do you know what I'm going to tell you? Well, do you? And we're like, yeah, fucking idiot. You come here every week before. Now that Yuko has helped the kids learn how to run a little faster and, and, and know what to do to train to run faster, they're finally able to beat a couple of the sixth graders as they are fourth graders. And of course, the best thing you could ever do in school is beat sixth graders when you're younger. Yuko's glad that you helped her, and she wants to know if we should throw a party for them, which actually is kind of cute. That's really nice. I think, yes, we should. So that's what we do. I'm just slowly chipping away at Tartars here, getting level ups, fusing Persona, getting more powerful. It's not really that much more interesting. It just gets a little harder. On Sunday, we decide to hang out with the band nerd, Kisuke, and we learn that his house was a little strict. He was never allowed to have a beef bowl. They had some weird rule about what can be over rice, and so he just never had one. I go back to see Bunkichi and Mitsuru, and they are having tough time with the fact that the persimmon tree might be cut down. So they go to say goodbye to it and mourn their son's death, which is really fucking sad. Well, it's full moon time, and just wouldn't you know it, there's a big old shadow in one of the buildings on Iwatodai. And so we've got to go there, and we've got to stop it. I take my party around this building, which looks like a hotel, until we reach the very top. In a bed on the third floor, we find the sex icon Hierophant. I'm not really sure why they're looking like this, but she's rubbing his face like, this feels good. It's not a terribly hard boss battle. They do fear us a little bit, and so we lose a turn, but it's not too bad because, well, we kill him quickly, and it's kind of confusing. After the battle, the door is completely locked and we can't move it. So we look around the room and this mirror suddenly just fucking transports us into hell. We see a most confusing anime cutscene, and I'm not really sure why this cutscene existed except for the boys. I don't, it's not really interesting. You, it's a 15 year old girl, you get to see her navel, and it's, it's Yukari. I don't know what she's doing in the shower, but that's where she is. We, on the other hand, instead of taking a shower, are wrestling with the voices inside of our head, trying to get us to just give up this whole thing. Well, we deny that shit and we get out of there. We're like, we're better than you, man. And then suddenly, out of the bathroom walks Yukari in a towel. Just, she's obviously absent-minded. Something's going on with her as well. But she comes up and fucking slaps me like it's my fault. You're the one in the shower. We pull ourselves together and find our other two teammates, where we then scour the hotel for bad mirrors that are protecting this other spirit or shadow. We're not really sure. We think it might be another boss. If you select the wrong one, it puts you back into the rooms separately. So now we've got to find each other. You've got to find the correct mirror. When you go into a room, the mirror reflects nothing. And when you crack it, it says, oh, now you can fight the shadow upstairs. We fight another boss, and this boss can actually charm us to attack our own party members. He charms me, and I whack the shit out of Mitsuru. But again, it's on beginner mode, and I've gotten some pretty high-level personas now, so I kick its ass. We come out of there having beaten that shadow, talking about whether or not it was just luck or I'm just that fucking good. And then suddenly we see those three dudes who killed someone from that website or whatever standing above us talking about our abilities and new teammates. It's very weird. These people are important. Why are they our enemy? We have no clue yet. It's finally time for Yukari to confront Mitsuru about all of the knowledge she has about Tartarus and the shadows. And this is actually kind of interesting. What happens is, is that explosion Yukari talked about near the beginning that killed her father 10 years ago, that was actually related to these shadows. See, Mitsuru's grandfather and even partly her father were working to use the shadows as a source of power, apparently a source of unimaginable power. So they were doing these experiments and when they were doing them, things got out of control and it blew up, literally taking out people buildings, hurting students at the school, a lot of weird things happened. It seemed to open up the dark hour at that time, and now, well, the world was changed because of it. And it happens everywhere, apparently. No one's even sure if anyone knows anywhere else that the dark hour exists. Then we get a nice animated cutscene while she's talking, although it's very jarring. I really don't like the way that they did this cutscene. It's kind of shitty. 
We also find out that Tartarus is our school because that's where the experiments originally took place, was in that place. And now it's turned into Tartarus, which is why that's where we go to fight the shadows. Things are getting a little more complicated as other information becomes available. And it will continue to go this way, which is nice because we need some meaty stuff to hold on to. Akihiko is still trying to convince Shinjiro to go back to his power and to stop living in the past. And Shinjiro is not having any of it. He's just impossible to move. We then see a scene between Mitsuru and Fuka. Mitsuru realizes that Fuka's ability with her persona to gather information is really, really helpful. But she also doesn't quite know all of the details about that shadow explosion thing in the past as much as she wants to. So she asks Fuka to help her get that information from her father. She intends to somehow get a hold of it by going there, having him come here or whatever, and she needs Fuka's help. Fuka does except, but it's a little difficult. Fuka then begins to talk to Mitsuru about how her parents, who are very overbearing, made her want to leave. And this is actually why she absolutely chose to stay here with us and join the team. She just needed to get away and feel important. We see Junpei wrestling with thoughts of his importance after the dark hour goes away. He feels he's only important now that he's able to use these persona powers and help with the shadows. But when it goes away, what will he have? Yukari reads the letter, the last letter she got from her father before he died in the explosion. And it's very sad, but definitely loves and misses her, so that's really nice to hear. Okay, so that's right, this mysterious boy has a name, it's Pharos, and he tells us that our persona is a mirror, and we can never escape our true self. Regardless, I will stay with you. Oh no, is this foreshadowing? Is something gonna- we're friends? It's at this point I begin to suspect Shuji is not a good person. I can't tell how, but the tone and the way he says things, he wants us to go on a vacation now that it's summer break, which is great, but he wants us to leave definitely. So he kind of talks us into going to visit Mitsuru's dad to help us find more information. He also wants to come with us. He may have an ulterior motive. Mitsuru does agree to go, though, because honestly, it would help her find out this information she wants to know. I know I said Junpei was a little weird, but he really does have feelings. He, he's being being a dick lately because he feels all powerful with his persona. But again, he's wrestling with these weird feelings and thoughts. All of us are outside school later that day when Natsuki comes over to see Fuka and actually wants to hang out with her. Fuka ends up going because, well, they are friends now. But the director does come up to us and say, hey, I have a new potential user here. His name is Ken. He's pretty young, though, so he's just going to be helping out. But for right now, we know that he has potential. Regardless of this, we're so excited to go on summer vacation and see Mitsuru's dad's place because, well, they're fucking rich. So we get this free big ass boat ride and we get a free stay at a place that has a beach and pretty much everything just given to us, which is so awesome, awesome. They are all in awe because of the enormous size of her house. And this is why the disparity between her and Junpei really shows its head here. Like, she is very, very fucking rich. Oh, impressive looking. Then her dad walks in, and he almost seems exactly what you'd expect a very, very, very rich man to do to his kids. Walks up and says nothing, and then leaves. And everyone thinks, holy shit. We get it. But it doesn't matter, because it's fucking beach time. That's right. All the boys are sitting there talking about the beach stuff. And then Junpei starts commenting on the girls' outfits, which is, you know, so gentlemanly of him. Mitsuru's dad turns out to be a little bit more compassionate than I first thought. He even seems to care a bit. I think things are just skewed because of what happened in the explosion 10 years ago and the brevity of the situation. So he does talk to Mitsuru about it. And then he gathers all of us together to give us some information that no one else in the world has as everyone in the explosion died. So he has this recording and he gives it to the kids to watch. And it's kind of upsetting because the scientist who's on the screen who talks about doing these these experiments where the explosion happened just before the explosion happened is talking about the risks they know that they were taking. But it turns out to be her dad, Yukari's dad. And that's why he died. It's not because he was near the explosion. It's because he fucking caused it. And it's pretty upsetting. So everyone agrees that I should go help her and talk to her and see what's going on. And this is where we get to learn a little bit more about her character. Obviously, the truth kind of fucking hurts. He came out of nowhere. And she's very upset that he was in charge of the research team. 
This does give her a little bit of motivation though. And uh, on top of us helping her understand uh, like yeah. you are okay, you're not a horrible person. You don't have to think like that. You can still help. Don't try and label yourself like that. Well, it was a long night, so everyone decides to take a little hike out in the woods. And so people separate. But then the director calls us and says he's at a lab on the island and something has escaped. A machine. We need to look for it. But we're not a part of this. That's right. We're out having fun trying to pick up girls. And it's a little weird. And I'm not very fond of this section. We literally go around the beach trying to pick up women. And, you know, with these three dudes, it's not happening. I don't understand why we're trying. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be endearing. It's a little weird and not something that I would have done. I mean, I can't relate to it at all. Maybe that's what's going on. What do you want anyway? Then see an animated cutscene of this woman who's wearing a very plain blue dress and what looks to be headphones. We're not sure, but her neck is covered in this white piece of, I don't know, clothing. So we actually go up and talk to her. The second we go up and say something to her ourselves, she just freaks out and says, I've got to figure this out somewhere safer and then fucking darts past us. We go into the woods to find her and she comes out and says, I have been searching for you which is really weird. It's her highest priority to be with me. What the fuck is going on? Well, it turns out this girl is not a, just a human. She's an anti-shadow weapon. She is a machine designed to fight shadows. But for some reason, she is connected to us, and we don't know why. Back at home, Shinjiro is actually doing some kind of deal with these three that killed someone or shot someone. He's getting these pills. We're not sure exactly what they're for yet. They're called suppressants. But these guys are asking about us. I'm skipping over the rest of the beach time because it's really boring and it's just them at the beach. You don't really learn any more character development and there's nothing interesting that happens. So we finally come back home. When we come back home, the night we come back, I sleep and wake up. I guess the, the anti-shadow weapon woman is standing over my fucking bed just staring at me. I'm not a girl. I am I guess. I am here. Junpei is trying to gauge how he should feel after we get rid of the dark hour because he just doesn't feel important. He doesn't feel useful, which sucks. I can understand that feeling. That wouldn't feel very good when you finally find something you're good at. We have finally reached the end of Kenji's social link, and he has actually learned a lesson, and he even questions whether or not he was sad that Amiri left because he loved her, or just the idea of being in a relationship with a teacher, which actually means a lot, honestly, because he was pining after a teacher. At this point, I finally unlocked the ability to fuse more than just two persona. I can now fuse up to three. This will still give me results kind of similar to what the two do, except that I have more options for abilities that transfer from the old persona to the new persona, which is really helpful. You also do get to see a few persona you can only get in a triple fusion, but at least now I have the option, and it's kind of fun to see all the options that we have available to us as we finally get up the tower even further. Also, I kicked out Mitsuru for Aegis, and she is super strong. She's got guns in her hands, man. Junpei actually tells us exactly what it is we need to date either Fuka, Yukari, or Mitsuru. Mitsuru, I need high academics. Yukari, I need high charm. And Fuka, I need high courage, which is pretty helpful, and that's the reason why you get those up. Yuka and I are finally getting a little hot and heavy, and really what that means is, is that she implied that maybe I could be the father of her child, yada yada. Well, our relationship is getting even more intimate, and we're spending time at her house. Yet again, we see Shinjiro getting something from these three people here, and they finally tell us the reason that they're so interested in us. They know that we're trying to get rid of the Dark Hour, and they don't want to lose the power from the Dark Hour, which means they are Persona users. They don't want us to get rid of it. They want to use their power. And so they're like, we're coming for them. Tell them. The devil social link is in the mall, and it's this well-dressed man. First, you have to have your charm high enough to talk to him. Then you have to give him 40,000 yen over a couple different days to finally get him to be your social link. Once you unlock him, he is an insane infomercial type salesman who sells fake products to people and profits off of it. He's also very, very fucking weird. I go on one of our last dates before the social link is over with Yuko, and I should have told her to mind her own business in this one just to see what she would have done, but... <laughs> Whatever. Well, summer vacation is actually still going on. We don't have school yet, but we do have special training for the kendo team that we accepted so we can do this cool, big, like, championship. And it's really cool. Every day we go do this special training. We do still get the nighttime to ourselves, though, where we can visit a couple social links only at night and go to Tartarus. 
I visit Tanaka, who you can only visit at night in the mall, and he says that I am a handsome boy, which is great, tries to teach me a new vocabulary word, and just is really stoked on himself. I'm such a handsome boy. <gasps> new word to our vocabulary? Repeat after me. Placabo? The stress is on the middle syllable. That night during the dark hour, Fuka wakes us up and says, holy crap, get up here, there's a shadow somewhere. The gang says they sent Akihiko ahead to the Naganaki Shrine so he could check out the shadow by himself, but we need to get over there as quick as possible. We arrive upon a crazy scene. The dog from earlier is laying on the ground with blood all around him. However, Akihiko says the shadow was already gone when he got here. Koromaru, the dog, actually defeated the shadow on his own. I have no clue how he did this, but apparently they think he might be able to be a Persona user. So everyone gathers the dog up and decides, well, he's our dog now. He's going to hang out with us. It's our monthly visitor the week before the full moon shows up and Pharos just has to blab his mouth about all the bad stuff that's going to happen to us. And also there's a bunch of more, you know, foreshadowing. The director actually said he theorized that the dog could use a persona, and they're going to try and figure out a way that he can. Ooh. We revisit Tanaka and find out that his shareholders are all of his customers. And I'm not really sure how legal that is, but as the stocks rise and customers keep buying things, he's making more money, so I, I don't know, man. Thinking of offering you a job. Well, the After of practicing in Kendo for the whole week, we get geared up to go fight in this championship. And boy, do we ever. We go wailing crazy on these people, looking awesome, and everyone thinks we're really cool because we practice so much. Look at that. Wow, he's so cool. There is another competitor everyone talks about, Mamoru Hayase, and they say he's the best. Well, he's actually impressed, even though he won, with what we did. So he invites us to hang out with him. He's another social link. Mamoru. It's full moon time and Fuka has located another shadow in somewhere that's like an underground structure. I guess explains to them that there might be a facility around here used by the military. So we decide to go check it out. Of course, when we get there, these two are there waiting for us. And they say that we are Strega. They call us Strega. Who's they? Does anyone else know about you three? It's confusing, but they decide that they're going to lock us in here. So we have to go fight the shadow by ourselves. They're hoping that we die, but I mean, we're probably going to win. I mean, we're really cool. This area is just a linear hallway with some treads on the ground, some tread tracks of what looks like to be a tank. We run past all the shadows and the boss is a tank. It's a tank. It actually comes in two so they can split apart. You've got to beat both of the enemies kind of close together. So you got to be a little careful about how you attack. They aren't necessarily difficult. And when they die, the other one revives the other one. Now they cannot revive the entire time you're fighting. You, If you kill them several times over and they revive, eventually they'll run out of mp to revive each other or at least the ability to so as long as you are just persistent you can destroy them without too much effort and they aren't really weak to much so a lot of the times i'm just healing and attacking healing and attacking over and over it's really not a scary fight but it's kind of cool once defeated we talk to the director saying hey we're locked in here strega these other persona users locked us in here he acts like he doesn't know who they are and questions other persona users huh the next day, we talk to Maya in the morning, and we actually learn that she's definitely a drinker, and she loves playing MMOs, even MMOs that have no one playing them. So she's just happy to talk to you about her personal feelings, which is fine with me. Pharos continues his onslaught of foreshadowing and vague language so that you can feel, you know, friendly towards him, I guess. He says, what are friends for? The next morning, Mitsuru says, hey, I've got something to show you. Come with me, because it's pretty cool. The cutest thing ever. They built a device for Koromaru to activate his own persona. He is now part of the team. Yes, he is a party member that can come summon a persona. Tanaka tells me that he is selling fake x-ray specs so that people can see through other people's clothes. Obviously, they don't work, and he's refusing to answer any customer problems at all, so he's just making money here. Then Tanaka tells me, a 15-year-old, that I would be handsome in briefs for a magazine ad. I think he's going to go to jail. After a few requirements, thin young man who sits in the park opposite of the young girl we played with needs a red pen so that we can be his social link. Luckily, Koromaru has a red pen for us. We go back to the dorm and Koromaru has it under his paw. He gladly gives it to us because, I don't know, he's a dog. He doesn't need the red pen. After we get the pen, Koromaru looks at us longingly like he wants us to take him on a walk. You can walk the dog at night. Sometimes people will join you. It's so cool. You can walk him. I mean, seriously, look at this. He's so excited for you to walk him. I can't help but walk him sometimes. It's just like, look, he's running around. He finds stuff for you. Look how much fun he's having. 
Uh, Mitsuru demands we go to summer classes while on summer vacation because we're missing out on great education. Sure, I'm getting smarter, but Mitsuru needs to keep her nose out of my business. At night, Tanaka tells me that he was working with someone who then didn't really like what was going on and left, so now he's kind of doing bad things to him by making his company go under, which sucks. It's Sunday, and there's a summer festival going on. Yuko calls us and asks if we want to go with her to the summer festival, which is a really cool idea. Sadly, that thin man who has his social link is only on Sundays, so we miss out, but hey, summer festival. We walk over to the summer festival with Yuko and hang out with her for a while, getting some food, just talking, learning a little bit more about each other, which is really neat. I wonder who else I could have gone to the summer festival with had I had the option. Not only this, but the summer festival lasts a little bit longer than just that night. You can go watch some special movies with friends. Kenji and I go watch a movie. In fact, you can ask other doormates to go with you to see different movies. Each of these movies does the same thing it did earlier, possibly gives you one of your three main stats for the social link area, academics, courage, or charm. Going with each of these characters is helpful, but you don't need to if they're already high enough for you. Man, we're about to hit floor 100. This thing is huge. There are so many more floors after this. Kisuke and I go watch a movie together, the band nerd, you know, we learn a little bit more about each other and watch a fun movie. During the festival, Junpei is by himself walking down the strip, and he sees this girl in a white dress. We know that she's with Strega, those other two dudes who are mean, but he doesn't. We haven't actually met her yet. So he talks her up as she's sitting there drawing in this square. He doesn't know anything about her, but he thinks, you know, she's interesting. So he talks to her, and she kind of brushes him off. But this is not the last time he'll see her. We know that Maya is a teacher, so the next time we hang out with her, she gets upset about someone at school, another teacher, making fun of her for, or treating her badly for making an error in her gradebook. So, I guess she's not doing a great job. Next, we go to the movies with Yuko. We see a movie with Kazushi. Tanaka offers to take us under his wing as an exclusive model. And I'm not really sure what to say to this, because this guy is borderline... <laughs> finally get a free Sunday to talk to this man, Akinari, who is actually dying of a disease. And we go visit him to see how he's doing, and he's having trouble accepting his fate. Akihiko is seen trying yet again to convince Shinjiro to come back to our team to help us with Fighting Shadows. Obviously, he's a Persona user, and he even tries to goad him into it by saying, we have a dog, we've seen someone die, I mean, this is tough, come help us. Unbeknownst to them, Ken listens in, and is acting strange. Next, I go to the movies with Yukari. Akihiko and I also go to the movies together. Tanaka uses a cucumber analogy to try and convince us that looks are everything, and so what? Sometimes you want to get a better looking cucumber, but that's not true for everything, idiot. Game tries to let us take Koromaru to the movies, but we can't convince the theater owner that he's a stuffed animal, so he's not allowed to be here. Don't worry though, we give him treats, give him kisses, and tell him we'll get the movie on DVD when it comes out. Next, it's Junpei and my turn to kiss a little in the movie theater. And then Igus goes with me, and we watch Ninja War, which she learns to fight better from, I guess, I don't know. The next evening, Ken believes that he can be of assistance, even though he's young. He can use a persona, and he would like to join us and help us fight, which is what he does. And this decision comes after he learned about Shinjiro, even though he's not even part of the team. Junpei finds himself in the same area that young woman was before, and he starts to talk to her a little bit more, asking her what she's drawing, and he asks if he can see it when she's done. She does agree, but she doesn't think he'll know what it is. Next, we go to the movies with Fuka. Tanaka tells us that the guy he recently screwed over is going to school to be a prosecutor. He's now worried that that guy will come back after him and sue him for all the terrible things he's been doing. We visit Akinari again, and he is only 19 years old, dying from this disease. He doesn't want anyone's sympathy or pity, because it makes him feel bad about his situation. He probably doesn't really want to think about it, but it's all he can think about. Junpei goes back to the girl, her name is now Chidori, and he sees that she's got a cut on her hand while she's drawing, but she's not even reacting to it. He tries to get her to a doctor, but she's totally fine with it. Next, we go on a little date with Ken. We finally go back to the music club, and Kisuke has entered his music piece into a competition, and he wins. He's actually doing this to kind of get back at his dad, who does not want him to do music. He wants him to be a doctor, and he does. He wins. But it seems with Kisuke's good nature and helpful demeanor, he does not want to give up knowing all this doctor-type stuff and tries to help people whenever he can, which is right after he learns he won the competition. 
For some odd reason, the director wants Igus to go to school with us. I'm not sure why, if, probably to do whatever dastardly deeds he's doing in the background so no one gets to see him. Back to Tanaka, he wants us to be his successor and he'll even let us join his family. He'll adopt me. No, 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 he's, he's joking. It's just a weird sense of humor of his. Yeah, fucking right, this guy's weird. You feel like you understand him a lot. This time, Akihiko is demanding Shinjiro join the group, and he tells him that Ken, a 10-year-old boy, joined. But we're not sure why Shinjiro does suddenly just join. Was it because of Ken? Sadly, we just don't get to know as much about Shinjiro as we should. He obviously has some kind of problems and issues and things that happen in his life, and he asks us what we're fighting for. He cares, but we don't know why. So I just had it for fun. Finally, we see Kazushi again, but he is still in denial about stopping practice because of his knee and the fact that he won't be able to walk ever again. He is so upset that he's going to work even harder now. This is where Junpei messes up. See, we all know who she is, but he doesn't. He knows her as Chidori, the girl who's drawing in the square here. But he says, hey, do you want to hear something cool? I'm the leader of a group of powerful people who fight bad guys. She actually believes him, no duh, because she's part of Strega, but then she asks for more information. So she learns that he really is the leader and he you know, calls all the shots, and that they have persona, and he's like, she won't believe me anyway, this is just a cool story, but no, she believes him. We finally get enough courage to talk to this guy upstairs, a bald monk, but he will not do anything with us, a social link, until we get him a drink. To do that, we've got to go talk to the bartender, and we've got to go around the bar memorizing several people's drinks. Then we got to go to the bartender and tell him who wants what and where. Once we do that, he will take some alcohol up to the monk and we can actually use him as a social link and he talks to us he's weird and he is the tower arcana he doesn't really do well for himself which makes sense why he's the tower arcana he's constantly drunk and talks about how bad his life is it's the night of a full moon and junpei is on his way home to help us fight the big shadow however while contemplating what's going on in his life something happens to him we're not sure what the group gets together and fuka looks for the shadow Everyone's wondered where Junpei is because obviously he's not here right now. They're kind of worried about him, but they have to go fight the shadow without him. Sadly, Fuka cannot locate Junpei, but she does locate the shadow and the Polonia Mall. So she gets inside of her persona and finds out it is an electric monster tied to all the cables underneath the mall. But suddenly we see Junpei tied up. Chidori has chied him up now that she has learned that he is the leader and she's trying to get him to cancel the mission. She doesn't want them to fight the shadow, just like the other members of Strega. But Junpei is not the leader, nor does he have the ability to contact us and tell us to stop the mission. So we follow the cables around the mall until we find the shadow. And he's kind of creepy looking. Look at him. This dude's whole thing is that he eventually charges up some electricity and attacks you. If you equip a persona on your main character that's resistant to lightning, that's helpful. And, you know, your other characters just bring people who are resistant to lightning. And while he's charging, if you make him weak, if you knock him off balance, he can't charge anymore. So he gets totally screwed. This guy's really easy. Um... After the battle, we see a cutscene with Junpei and Chidori, where Junpei's like, I'm not the leader, sorry, I can't stop the mission. But for some reason, Chidori knows that we've destroyed the boss. Junpei doesn't understand why until she pulls out a gun. She's a persona user, so she's going to try and use her persona. However, Junpei breaks out just in time to knock the gun out of her hands before she's allowed to summon her. The next day, she's in the hospital recovering, and everyone's trying to ask her questions, but the only person she responds to is Junpei, and this is kind of how it's going to be for the rest of the game. I mean, obviously, she likes him. He was nice to her. It's, it's Sunday like again, and we get to see Akinari, and he is still struggling to come to terms with why I mean, this know. disease is happening to him no and not anyone else. No, I mean, I he's just not understanding why he's dying, dying, and he's trying to put some kind of like meaning to his life. So the monk, on the other hand, is indulging in Which alcohol and tobacco and course. just saying some kind of weird things like, you gotta refer to me you as San because sand I'm your me. elder boy. The world's not forgiving. We finally get our charm high enough to talk to Yukari and have her be our social link. She is the lover arcana, and she talks to us about how we're different from a lot of people, both losing our mom and her dad, although her mom isn't dead, she's just an ass. Junpei and the group find out that Chidori is not hurting herself on purpose, but... Chidori can actually heal her own wounds very quickly, so they're all a little confused about what exactly she is and what she can do. The Persona powers are kind of out in the open. 
No one's been able to research them. It's still fairly new, so these things are interesting and you get to hear about them firsthand. Kisuke laments that his dad's telling him to quit the music club and take over the family business of owning a hospital and being a doctor. He is obviously torn on what she, he should do because he really wants to stick with music. Tanaka's social link ends with him giving a donation and then bragging about the donation. It's a huge donation, and he hopes that one day the people he donated to will help him in his old age. Yuko has had motivation problems, although she is feeling much better now that she thinks she wants to be an athletic trainer. Maybe she's much better at this than she thought, and because we helped her, she feels much more confident about it. Back at the hospital, Shinji actually comes to visit Chidori with us, obviously being a little bit interested in what's going on. We're not really sure why, but we think he's going to join the team soon. When suddenly, Chidori acts like she's being choked. And out of friggin' nowhere, her persona appears on her bed, choking her. When this happens, Shinji runs over and shoves something in her mouth. It is a suppressant, the pills that he's been buying from Strega. He feels bad about something that happened in his past, and he's been trying to suppress his own persona. Well, luckily he was there so that he could give her the medicine, because no one knew that that was something they were going to have to do for her. So now things are getting a little more complex with her. Akihiko follows Shinji out of the hospital and tries talking to him yet again, smacks him in the face and says, look, you're wasting your power, man. You don't need to be doing this. Something bad did happen in his past, and he is letting it affect him so badly that he just can't help anyone. Akihiko also had something where his sister died when he was younger, but he still stands and fights, and that's what he's trying to tell Shinji. Next, we go on another date with Yukari, and we go pick out some flowers. We even try and see if we can get into her room, but she laughs and says, Nuh-uh, no one's seeing my room. The monk is trying his best to figure out what we're doing, because he just is so much different than us, and he doesn't think friendship is true and it's not real, and why would you be friends with anyone anyway? We visit Hitotoshi again, and he's just having an issue trying to wrap his head around how to treat people fairly. He's just going about it in the wrong angle, and it's not really helping, especially when people feel alienated by the things he says. In Tartars that night, I actually die once. I just get crit by this floor boss, and he destroys me in one full attack, full health. So I do use a plume of dust just to save myself time, so I'm down to nine. The cards at the end of the shuffle are starting to get ridiculous. We're getting very high numbers, and the experience increase that you get from picking these ones are enormous, so I get lots of level ups. Junpei visits Chidori by himself in the hospital, where she heals dead flowers back to full health. And he's like, whoa, so that's what's going on. That's how you can recover from those cuts on your hands. Junpei then confides in her. He thinks he's a nobody. He thinks he's pretending to be a hero. He doesn't really know who he is. He never really spent the time to figure out what he's good at. In fact, he doesn't feel like he's good at anything but fighting shadows. So now he's really feeling down on himself. We're visited yet again by Pharos, this time well before the month mark comes up. Akinari tells us that he enjoys reading books about heroes, hope, and heroism because he believes at the end of the book it'll be a happy ending, although he can't quite finish them. He's not really committed to ending things. Next, we go on another date with Yukari. And at first, we're hanging out in the mall. But then a little kid lost his mom. So she decides to help him, which is really nice. So we also decide to help as well. We then learn a little bit more about her mom. When her dad died in that explosion, she kind of lost her mind and started just dating any man she could, doing some kind of promiscuous things. And Yukari does not approve of those things. The next morning, we hear some kids talking about a typhoon that's going to destroy stuff on its way here, and that sounds terrible. Well, the typhoon is kind of ruining things, so everyone wants to go out and do things, but it's a little scary. And Junpei is very excited because he is just so happy to be going to visit Chidori. He feels much closer to her, so he's asking everyone about their plans. Another visit to the Velvet Room, and Igor gives us a new ability to fuse four or more Persona. This one's special, though. They've got to be specific Personas, and they will fuse into a very specific Persona, which is very powerful. In the morning, we have another three-day break. Respect for the age day. Ooh. We actually go and hang out with Mamaru, that very competitive dude from the Kendo team fight, and we start having competition to see who can eat the fastest. So that's our social link. If you decide to study on a day you have nothing to do, sometimes you raise your academics more than once. It'll say you have more time, so you might as well solve another problem. And you'll get academics upped twice, which academics takes the longest. 
Problem after Haven't watched a movie with everyone yet. Well, Shinjiro just joined, but he watches a movie with us. After all of these festivals and festivities are done, we actually have to go as a class to help clean up areas of the different areas that we had the festival in. So everyone gets together and there's these cute little interactions where all our classmates are talking. None of this is super important. This is more just flavor, understanding characters. And so Kenji offers for us to do a little test if the typhoon had not ruined things we could have done a comedy routine so we sit there and talk back and forth about doing comedy and everyone laughs it's a great time nothing real big happens but it's fun to see the characters doing what the characters would be doing if we weren't playing a video game just being themselves Yukari is trying to get reassurance from us for how she feels about her mom. She doesn't want her to get remarried, she's not sure, but she just doesn't want her to keep jumping back and forth between different men and living in different spots. She's never able to even know what her mom is up to. Back with the monk, he's lamenting about how old he is and how ugly he is, and eventually it'll happen to me too, and not to just rely on that because it would be a terrible thing to do, especially when you're going to get old and ugly just like him. We finally leveled up our courage enough to talk to Fuka and date her. And so the first thing that happens is we got to have courage enough to try the crappy food she's made and then maybe lie a little bit about it, you know, just to make her feel better. I'm sorry I have to say this, but I fused a persona called Incubus and look at that thing kind of poking out between his legs there. I don't know what that is, but it's there. And when you summon him to do damage in battle, it's prominent in battle, swagging it around. Also, I make this horse persona, and it's really bizarre looking. It looks just weird, because it's obviously standing up like a human, but it opens its mouth. It, the way that they made the animation is weird. We finally come to a floor boss that actually has some kind of difficulty behind him, using a spell called Megiddo. It's an almighty spell that has no resistances or anything like that. It's pretty much just fucking damage. However, this weird table with flying cutlery and plates on top of him only uses it twice in my battle, making him extremely easy. So I'm sorry for anyone who had trouble. We once again visit Akinari, and he finally comes to terms with the fact he's probably not going to read and finish all of those upbeat stories he wants to. He feels like they aren't actually written for him. He actually wants to write his own story. Maybe that will help. Yukari and I go on another date, and this time on her way to go eat food, she drops her wallet. And I'm not really sure why or where she did, but we, she goes back to retrieve it and asks us to stay here and wait. But we decide not to because she's taking a long time. Which is good, because this group of thugs took her wallet and she's trying to get it back. So we actually come to her aid and help her. She's a little embarrassed that we came to help her, which is understandable, but she's appreciative at least. The coach finally finds out about Kazushi's knee and he's pretty upset because he does not want Kazushi to throw his life away and we try our best not to like tattle on him but it's really hard we're his friend man. Kazushi understands though because we're friends. Later we head to the machine and see another scene of an unaware character being filmed and we actually get something interesting. See Fuka is comparing herself to some of the other characters in the mirror talking about wearing a bathing suit and being a little worried about it and I'm not sure how that feels. I'm not a young I was never a young woman so I was like out loud in the stream, hey, I don't know if this is true or not at all, I have no clue. Well, someone in the chat was able to actually help and said, yes, this is fairly true, which made me kind of start to rethink how the dialogue and things in games are played. And I'll talk more about this at the end because in the background, Fuka has also bought herself a waist slimmer that turns on. But for some reason, it doesn't actually slim her waist as much as it tickles her. So she's in the background laughing hysterically. She can't get this thing off. Mitsuru comes up to the door and all she can do is like yell her name while she's being tickled. And I was like, all right, all right. So I don't know what's going on here, but maybe I'll, I'll leave this out too. The monk talks to us a little bit about having to work all of his life to make money so that he can do what he wants to do. But since he's got to work all the time, how can he do what he wants to do with all the money he's made? So this is kind of a conundrum for him. My next hangout with Fuka ends with us trying to have the cat that we found on the roof try her food. Now she's gotten a little better, but it's so bad that the cat hisses at her and runs away. Even she reels back from tasting it. Yuko finally expresses her love for me, which is so wonderful, and nothing really happens other than asking me to stay with her for a while, so that's pretty cool I guess, but that's it, that's her social link. Well, it's the night of a full moon, and we all know what that means because Ferris won't shut his goddamn mouth about it. But Fuka realizes that both Ken and Shinji aren't here. She can kind of see maybe where they are, but no one really knows for sure. The next two shadows we have to fight are just waiting there for us. The one floating in the air actually protects the one on the ground, and the one on the ground 
runs a roulette wheel, and we've got to roll the roulette wheel every time it comes up. And each time it comes up, it's different. So this time you can see here some blue and red rectangles, and then in the center you have these pictures. The pictures correspond to status elements or sometimes damage, while the colors determine whether or not it's our party or their party that gets whatever effect or damage happens. So you can kind of get good at rolling the roulette wheel and stopping it so that you can have the effects go to them, which is super helpful. Obviously having it happen to you sucks, but as the fight goes on and you start to do these effects on the roulette wheel, when it's just the dog by itself doing the roulette wheel, it will cheat, make the roulette wheel in its favor. So the blue portion, which is happening to them, is small. And the red portion, when you stop it on that, it'll happen to you. The red portion's enormous. And sometimes it's just like triple damage and it almost kills my entire party, which it's really cool. And it's the characters even say in the battle, this isn't fair, what's going on? And so you just have to kind of get lucky in those situations. After the battle, everyone is still worried about Ken and Shinji and the worst thing imaginable can happen. They are off on their own and Akihiko runs ahead to see if he can find them. Well, it's going to be a little too late because you see, Ken knows who Shinjiro is. Shinjiro was originally part of this team a long time ago when it first started. He actually lost control of his persona and killed an innocent bystander who happened to be Ken's mom. So now Ken is here to get revenge on Shinjiro. The problem is, is the pale dude with the gun and Strega is coming around and he's going to kill Shinji and Ken anyway. So now Ken's revenge is rendered worthless. It doesn't matter whether he was going to do it or not. Shinji was going to die. And Ken is supposed to die. However, Akihiko was fast enough to at least get there. And everyone showed up to stop this guy from killing Ken as well. But Shinji doesn't make it. And we lose an entire party member to death. He dies. He actually dies in the game. And it's kind of sad because we don't get to see him very much. I wish we knew more about him. I think he sounds interesting. While we never actually saw him in school, he did go to school at our school. So they have a little memorial for him. Everyone talks about it. The principal says things and it's kind of a weird day. Akihiko goes up to his memorial when he's by himself and speaks out loud about how much he misses Shinjiro already. But as he begins to dawn on his own realizations and how he's going to stay and fight, his persona changes. It evolves. It's the first time we've seen this. So now he has a stronger persona, kind of going along with the fact that we are getting further in the game, we're leveling up, we're getting stronger, but also as a character, as a person, Akihiko has changed. Because no one else can actually know the truth behind Shinji's death, we all sit around after school talking about what happened because we're the only people we can talk to about this. Everyone else thinks he died of something else. We come back to see Bunkichi and Mitsuko, and they say that, hey, some of the students actually want the persimmon tree to stay and not be cut down. They're starting a coalition to stop it from happening, so they're very happy. However, I take this opportunity to lie, not because I'm interested in lying, but I really thought, well, what's going to happen? Is something going to change? Are they going to hate me for this? Because they asked whether or not I started this coalition to stop it, and I said yes. That was a lie. I didn't do nothing. Akihiko finds Ken brooding in the spot where his mom died many years ago, and he talks to him, he tries to give him a pep talk, like, look, dude, this is just how it's going to be. We need your help, though. You got to choose what you want to do. Do you want to help or do you want to stay here? Just as Fuka is about to run out and look for Ken herself, Koromaru starts barking at the door and Ken walks through. He's back. He's decided he is going to help, that there's no reason not to come use this special power he has to fix things. At this point, Pharos is talking about some kind of end, the fall. At some point, everything is going to end, but we're not really sure what he's talking about. At this point, I've become a Persona Fusion Master, or something like that. I understand it a little better. I've been putting some Persona together, getting some really cool ones, and trying to trick my party out to have something interesting. And in fact, I do find myself summoning a Persona that can heal. I then become almost the main healer in the party. For some reason, it just works out that way. Mutatsu the monk does talk about how he does feel bad living alone. He wishes he didn't, but he is so stuck on the fact that bad things have happened to him and, oh, this is how it's going to be. This self-destruction just needs to come to an end. Akinari writes a little bit of a story for us and shares it with us about a pink alligator who's too easy to spot and just can't get any food and his friend, a bird who just can't fly and how they're friends, but he doesn't know how he wants it to end yet. On our MMORPG the next day, Maya tells us about how some of the teachers stuff their bras and how you can just massage your breasts in the shower and they'll be bigger or something. I don't know, but it's really weird. On my next date with Yukari, she does finally 
tell me thanks for helping her back then with her wallet, even though she was a little embarrassed at first. It's just hard for her to accept help, especially since she's been taking care of herself for the past 10 years since her dad died. Akinari decides that the pink alligator actually eats the bird friend one day when he's sleeping in his mouth, probably because he's so hungry he can't stand it. He can't find his own food. But there still isn't quite a clear ending yet. Mutatsu is actually extremely drunk and he thinks we are his son when we come in. So he starts yelling us as if we are his son. And it's not going well. He does realize a little too late that we aren't, but it's not going well. On her next date with Yukari, she expresses that she wants us to feel the same way she does about us. And that's actually the part where we are finally kind of in a relationship, even though I'm with Yuko, who don't tell her. Akinari is slowly coming terms with the fact that everybody dies, he's just dying a little earlier. And it does happen to everyone, so he feels less sad, he's still lonely, but he feels less sad, which is good. It is one more day until the full moon, and this time it is the last shadow, at least as far as we understand. Mitsuru tells us that the first time she awakened her persona was a long time ago, when a research team was getting attacked by a shadow. And this is kind of how Mitsuru became herself, I mean for a long time she's had to be an adult. As Fuka searches for the last shadow, they realize that Strega is probably going to try and stop us yet again, but this is the last time that they can stop us before we fight the last shadow. Takeya, the pale man with the gun who just likes to shoot everyone, is talking all high and mighty like he has this power over everyone and it's really weird, but he really wants to stop us because he thinks we need the power from the shadows. So we fight both him and Jin, even though Chidori is the third person, she's still in the hospital. Jin actually has a grenade in his hand. I didn't fucking know that was a grenade. I had no fucking clue. During this battle, we also find out that these guys are not normal Persona users. They were given their Persona. It's like an artificial Persona. And so this is one big reason why they don't want the Dark Hour to go away. They had to fight tooth and nail for this. They have probably had to go through a lot and they don't want it to end. But in the end here, at least, Jin pulls Takaya down the, over the bridge and we just lose sight of them. High above the bridge next to us flies the last shadow with the hooks in his back and everything. You know, that thing. I, I don't know what that is, but it seems pretty unfun to me at least. This guy has a small mechanic where he has these three statues in front of himself. You've got to destroy the statues before you fight him. They aren't necessarily difficult, but he can kind of evade your attacks for a short while and make the battle go out a little longer. The thing is, is that he's just not that hard still. It's not really necessarily a hard boss, especially in beginner mode. So I kick his ass. That was it. That was the 12th shadow. So we have a celebration, a victory cheer even, and I get to choose the victory cheer. Hip hip hooray! And they all look at us like we're fucking insane, so I guess says hip hip hooray. Pharos talks to us during the next day, which is the first time he's ever talked to us outside of the dark hour. This is not good. He says, this is it, we're done, we'll never see each other again, farewell. During our celebration, Mitsuru's father comes in to congratulate us and talk to us about what's going to happen next, if anything is going to. Is the Dark Hour completely gone? Are our Persona abilities gone? Well, first, we all need a picture together, because of course we do. So a cute little anime cutscene plays where Junpei ends up being flung backwards? I don't really know how that happens, but here's the picture, guys. A familiar cutscene plays, the clock hitting midnight, and this is usually what happens when it hits the Dark Hour. Uh-oh. It's the fucking dark hour. Well, this is shitty. Plus, they don't know where the director and Igis are. They're just missing. Everyone's panicking and they decide at the last second, let's just go see if we can figure out where they are. Oh, God damn it. The director was bad. I was right earlier. So he does. He turns out to be bad. He wanted us to kill the 12 shadows because something special happens when you kill them. I'm not sure what it is yet, but he did it for us. He he forced us to do this. He tricked us. So it was all a lie. Not only that, but then he admits to faking the message Yukari heard from her dad. He actually changed it. Her dad actually said not to fight the shadows. Do not do it. But he doctored it. I guess flings herself at us because now she's being controlled by the director and a cutscene plays with us being put on crosses kind of i guess it's a little bit like a crucifixion and we're at the top of the tower and apparently he's gonna kill us all for some reason i'm not sure why while we're up on these crosses the director brings mitsuru's dad up because well he's not gonna let him live either why would he so they both actually draw guns on each other and fire sadly the director kills mitsuru's dad 
her dad does peg him in the side of the arm. So now we've got a hurt director and things are looking bad for everyone. The director then orders Igus to shoot us, but for some reason she doesn't. She's able to overcome the order and instead frees us. When she does, the director tries to pull out the device he used to control her before, but Koromaru jumps in and takes it from him. That dog is fucking awesome. He realizes he's been defeated, but for some reason, instead of doing anything like, you know, using the gun he has, he just goes backwards off the building and says, that's it. Everyone gathers around Mitsuru and her father, realizing that no one will ever know the truth behind what happened. He's dead, and even though he did swear that he would help anyone he could for all the bad stuff that's happened, if it cost him his life, well, it did. Yukari gets to finally hear the unedited audio of her father saying, you must not defeat the shadows. And it's very sad, but he just couldn't stop it. He tried his best. He really did. The next day, Junpei visits Chidori in the hospital, and he touches her hand. She clearly is affected by this touch, or just the fact that she likes Junpei in general, and she can't take the feelings she has for him. Okay. We visit Akinari for the last time, and he tells us the end of his story. He's decided that the pink alligator cannot eat anymore after accidentally eating his friend, and uh, dies right where he is. But, for some reason, it creates an oasis for the other animals to come stay at. He realizes that, even though his life may be ending, he can be helping other people. He wants to have shared these moments with someone and help them learn some kind of lesson, made some kind of difference, anything. And he hopes that it's us, just someone, because we've come to visit him. However, at the end of our meeting, he disappears. He's actually dead. We got to see the last piece of him he left here to talk to us. After this, everyone is extremely confused on what to do now that the Dark Hour is still here and no one knows what happened with the director and why he did this to us. What exactly is going on? A haze settles on the dorm and all of the people involved in these shadows and the fighting and the personas, and it's really confusing. Suddenly, a transfer student shows up. He seems popular enough, and he eventually ends up coming into our group and hanging out with us. But by this time, everything is a blur. No one's really sure what to do anymore, and this transfer student is acting kind of odd. Now, the days after this, there's a lot going on. There's even a class trip where we all go to a hotel far away and do some cool stuff out in the city. And the transfer student actually hangs out with our group, even though our group is all the Persona users. So it's getting kind of weird. We also learn that Takaya and Jin did not die, and they come to the hospital to find Chidori and break her out so that she can help them take revenge on us and... I guess stop us? I don't know. The Dark Hour is still here. So Fuka realizes that she's being contacted by Chidori. So she talks to her, and now we have to go figure out what's going on with her. They're at Tartarus waiting for us. Chidori is a very easy boss battle and takes me a mere several minutes to just destroy her ass. I mean, at this point, what is she doing here? Well, she explains that she fears loss, she fears death, she fears many things. She doesn't understand herself, and she fears that her time is coming to an end. And she loves Junpei, she really does. And she realizes she can't handle those feelings, and doesn't want to be here anymore. But before anything can happen, Takaya shoots Junpei directly in the chest. This kid's gonna die. However, Chidori does something unusual. She talks to him in his dreamlike state as he's dying and explains to him, you can't die. I can't handle this, but you can. So I will give up my life to save yours. And that's exactly what she does. Just like with the flowers, she gives up her entire life just to make sure Junpei can live. And Junpei takes this pretty hard, if you could imagine. And he gets so mad that he summons a real strong persona and blasts Jin right in the face. Takaya and Jin run off, and everyone hovers around Chidori, hoping she can make it, but there's no way. They understand the consequences of what she did, and Junpei's persona evolves, because now he realizes he really does have someone to fight for, the person who gave their life for him. Junpei finally opens up her sketchbook to see what it was she was sketching. Obviously, she's not going to finish it, but it happens to be a portrait of himself. This is pretty tough to look at. With everything going on, I guess finally talks to everyone about the transfer student, Ryoji, and she says, he's weird. What was he doing here? After this, she actually follows him home. It's been a little while he's been hanging out with us, but on her way home, the dark hour appears and he is standing there unaffected, just looking at the moon, wondering why it looks like this color. Sadly, he is not just a person. I guess actually recognizes him. 
He was a shadow a long time ago, and she, in her infinite knowledge, decided she can't defeat him because he's so powerful. So she traps him inside of a nearby young boy. And this is what, (laughs) this is where things mess up. He finally is out in the world. Well, I wonder who he was trapped inside of. It ends up being the main character. I mean, obviously, Pharos was the one who was with him for a long time. They killed the last shadow. Something was supposed to happen. This transfer student comes up and starts hanging out with them. You just can't help but hang out with them. But it makes sense that the MC is the person he was trapped inside of. Ryoji turns out to be the appraiser, someone waiting for this very special being to come to him. Deadly when I guess initiates combat with him he actually hurts her pretty bad he doesn't realize who he is right at first and so he attacks and just lashes out out of fear but she's hurt a bit so they decide well we should probably take her back and talk about what's going on ryoji explains that nyx is the mother of shadows and in ancient times she bestowed death to this world now that he is here he's awakened she will come to this world soon and cover the land in darkness vanquish all life Humans will literally be gone. And the sad part is is that they won't just be dead. They'll have the apathy syndrome everyone's been talking about. They'll literally be just be lifeless shells standing there doing nothing. So when this maternal being gets here, it's not going to be good. And now that we've talked to him a little bit and we've learned what is actually going to happen and why the Dark Hour is still here, the fact that Nyx is going to come destroy us all, he explains that there is literally no way to defeat her. There's nothing you can do. He says the only option you have is to survive and eventually get killed by her. But there is one more thing he thinks could happen. What if the main character kills him? See, he's not supposed to be human. This is just a side effect of being put inside him for so long. But what if he kills him? There's a possibility that it extends the time Nyx gets here, but also makes everyone forget about all the things that have happened. See, the point behind this is that since you can't defeat her, as long as you forget everything and don't have to live in fear for the next several months, when you do get killed or die, it will be instant. You'll never know what happens. So it's kind of like a mercy kill. Like, hey, if you do this, you won't know it will happen. You don't know when, you don't know why. It will happen so fast, it'll just be darkness. So you have a choice. You can try to stay or you can kind of give in. And we have one month to decide. And that whole month, everyone just talks about what we should do. do, We're deciding slowly. What should we do? Should we kill him? Should we not? Should we just fight Nyx and hope for the best? Most of the people are saying that they want to fight. And Iga says, I'm not human. I won't die. I won't be have apathy syndrome. I'll be here all alone. I like you guys a lot. I don't want you to suffer. So please kill him so you don't suffer. We do end up convincing her that maybe that's not the best idea. We, we should try and fight this maternal being. In the end, it's my decision. So everyone talks to me about what they're going to do or what they want to do. We walk into our room where Ryoji is waiting for us. He explains to us that the second you kill me, everyone's going to wake up being normal high school students. You'll never know what happens. He actually has to ask us twice. The first time we say no. He then transforms into that special persona we saw at the very beginning of the game that we summoned when we first started our fight. And he is that persona. See, we summoned him out of kind of fear and unbelief and all this crazy stuff going on. And now we get to see that it's actually him. He's been inside of us this whole time. He was Pharaoh, of course, I said earlier. So I decide, let's kill him. We're going to kill him and have a mercy kill. Suddenly, everything disappears three months pass by and we see our characters walking by with no idea what has ever happened they're just friends at school they go through a couple daily things nothing nothing's crazy it's just a normal day at high school in the end mitsuru is still the class president and we end on her giving a speech and even talking about her father who died of natural causes at least she believes And the game ends on us kind of deciding what we should do now that the year is about over. This is about the time that it's theorized that they die instantly. Everything just ends here. Although there is a picture in the credits here that shows them doing this karaoke that they were just talking about. So maybe it's not. Maybe they live just a little longer. Maybe this is just the right place to end it before we see what happens, which is fine. The game is over. We see credits. That's right. We beat Persona 3. Now, before anyone goes crazy... Let me just talk about the fact that I did the bad ending. There are two endings to this game. That's right, spoiler. 
However, I'm going to do another video because I feel like I wanted to also add the answer in. However, this game is fucking long as shit and this video is already insanely long, so I didn't want to put them both together. Plus, how many times am I going to have a chance to show you separate endings and learn more about a game? I mean, I can make these two videos and they really do stand as two separate videos. Whereas in the future, you're going to find I can't do that with games with multiple endings, such as like Growl Answer 2. I'm not going to be able to do many more of the endings. Maybe a fun, you know, side project that I do, but it's nothing going to be like, you know, like this. I actually have a chance. So I decided to take it. Yes, I skipped over a lot of stuff at the end. None of it really mattered. I mean, at this point, we we're about to learn that the world's going to end and we end it. But next time, I'll cover the things that I missed and then all the rest of the people's social links will finish and we'll see this new story stuff and we'll even get to do the answer, which is the next little campaign. It's much shorter, but it's still something I'd like to do. I think it will help with our understanding of what happens further in the game. And the only way to understand the answer is to play the second ending that this game has, which is much, much further away. There was a lot of game I could have played, but obviously giving in like that just ends it right there. So let me just talk quickly about how I felt about the game because this was a very interesting game for me. This is not a game I would choose out of a lineup to play. It's just not my cup of tea. Having half of the game be social links, while they aren't bad by any means, don't get me wrong, it's just not the type of game I would normally pick over another one like, you know, Final Fantasy. But it was a great game to play and I'm still excited to try and figure out what secrets lie ahead of me for this Nyx character and for what happens in the other ending and also the answer, right? It's called the answer. It's gotta have some kind of answers, right? But I really enjoyed this game. And one of the things I kind of learned is, is that during this playthrough, dialogue in video games matters. It's like this revelation. I, I went to college and I learned to be very, very critical of lots of dialogue and stories. I've read everyone's favorite stories, the best books ever written, and then had to analyze them or be critical about them. And at that point, I had learned how good dialogue works. And so now playing video games where dialogue is a much lower standard, it's hard for me to get into. And it's just kind of my fault. It's not, you know, the game. It's my fault. And as I was playing the scene earlier where Fuka is talking in the mirror, I realized I had no way to know if that was true or not. I mean, I was never a young woman. Like I said, I, I would never have said any of those things that she said about feeling self-conscious standing next to Yukari in her bathing suit, right? But someone in the chat actually enlightened me and said, hey, yeah, this is actually pretty accurate. And I thought, oh my gosh, maybe there's a little more to this. And as I thought and thought and thought, it did lead to this revelation of maybe it doesn't matter exactly what the dialogue is. Instead of being so critical of the dialogue being bad, instead, just take it for what it is and try and figure out what the person was trying to say. Like, what are they trying to tell me in this game? This was a real instance of a young woman who felt inadequate next to a friend because of body image issues. And that is a absolutely something that happens nowadays a lot. So I think I need to just take it easy and really look at dialogue. And it's what a wonderful thing to happen. I, I want to learn new things. I don't want to be right. I want to know the truth. And the truth is, is that I should be taking more time to look into this and not treat it so critically, even if I think it's bad. So this game was fantastic. It's a fantastic game. The stories are silly. Some of the stuff is cheesy. The fights aren't necessarily that hard, especially on the beginner difficulty, but it doesn't matter. It's still a really good game and it's very long. So if you're looking for an RPG that's long and has lots of involvement in story and both fighting, this is the game for you. Let's end it here. And before the video does end though, I took away the guessing game, which sucks a little bit, but everyone gets to see my streams. In fact, I'm like two games ahead, so there's no fucking secrets here. But I do want to thank the patrons because they're wonderful. And I have four of them right here. Thank you guys so much for subbing to the Patreon. If you'd like to join the Discord, that's also in the description. Thank you so much for watching an almost two hour long video. I'm going to end it before it hits two hours. Thank you so much. I will see everyone for the next video, which is Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix.